This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. This other Eden, demi-paradise. This fortress built by nature for herself. an island. Our land is small and the sea is never far away. The world is full of islands but none is framed and ringed with such diversity, so many variants of the manner in which the shore must meet the sea. This is the edge of England, sometimes a barrier, a cliff of chalk, the abrupt full stop of geography, sometimes a beach where land and water come to terms on a slipway of sand. For 3,000 miles of cave and bay and beach and cliff and sand and shingle, for such a distance wanders the coastline of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. For hundreds of generations, this borderline has been shaped and sculptured by the endless argument of the ocean. Resisting here and surrendering there, modeled anew in every mile. It is something unique, something of great value. The coast has its own growing things, its own a special botany which thrives on the salt and sand as nothing else can. The sea pink, whose flower is everlasting. The campion, which grows doggedly everywhere beside the sea. There is the population of the cliffs and crags. The kittiwake, smallest of the gulls, forever calling its own name into the wind. The shag, the deep sea diver, emerald-eyed member of the pelican clan. Terns in great variety, common, sandwich, little, roseate and arctic, though hard to tell one from the other. And the trim and pleasant puffin, masked like a clown for the breeding season, for the rest of the year, its beak is not quite so fancy, but just as efficient. There is the intimate land between the tides, the rock pools and the shallows, and the complex society of the shore. Rock, pebble, sand or mud, each a world within a universe, within the warm sea tide. mud, the peacock tube worm, who cements himself into a self-made cylinder of debris 
and waves his fan of tentacles among his microscopic food. Of all areas, the natural history of the shore is the richest. For the human kind of England, the coast was always the barricade. The sea was a moat and the shore a bastion. The Romans were the first to build solidly on the coast. They built forts such as Porchester to keep the Saxons, or as they are called now, the English, out of England. 700 years passed, and then came the Normans with their great fortifications. Land Stephen in Carmarthen to subdue the Welsh. Dunstanborough in Northumberland. A network of command posts to control a hostile country. More centuries passed. The power of Rome was a memory. Gunpowder had made the castles obsolete. And still the coast was as wild and as empty as it had ever been. And then, in the wake of time, the sea began to be something not exclusively to keep the world away, but something to be used. Not a barrier, but an asset. Gradually, we became aware that we could employ all this wasted water, that the sea was a highway and a thoroughfare to other lands. So were born the ports, the harbors, the starting places of the voyagers, and the entrance gates of the strangers the seaward doors of a nation that was now, above all, a maritime nation. And by and by, the hemline of England became a new thing altogether, called the seaside. In a sense, the seaside was born in 1754, or rather invented by that portentous pioneer, Dr. Richard Russell, who declared the healing virtues of sea water to be drunk, if you please, as medicine. It was the gloomy argument of Dr. Russell that a pint of sea water was wholesome and beneficial. Indeed, essential for bathers, since only with a noggin of sea water inside could the body sustain the ordeal of feeling it outside. So came the cult of the sea bath. And an essential part of this punitive process was that it had to be done in the chill of dawn and in midwinter. Yet most survived to tell the tale and spread the word. Then the eye of the first gentleman, George, the Prince Regent, the fashionable trendsetter of the times, fell on a small fishing port called Brighthelmston. It never looked back. Within the generation, it had become Brighton, the smartest seaside of the Georgian quality, of the bucks and the bows whose garments were as tight as their morals were loose. Thus did Brighton become the monument to the modishness of Dr. Russell's wonder drug, the sea. Then suddenly came the revolution, the industrial revolution. Now came the lowering tyranny of the machine, when all values were changed and the factory and office were born. In places that never saw the sun, let alone the sea, a new kind of man and woman appeared working 14 hours a day, week after week, year after year, without any rest or easement as of right. Into this somber state of affairs emerged a sort of savior, Sir John Lubbock, one of the great Victorians. For it was he who invented the bank holiday and forced it into law in 1871. Incredibly, the workers of England found themselves with three legal days off a year. The miraculous precedent of the holiday and the seaside was born for the english had been an island race all their lives without knowing it where had the seaside been all those years it remained it was the visitors who changed with the years changed into something loose as befitted the abandon of the beach the victorian bathing bell gave way to the well-clad pin-up of the Edwardians. And the years brought their own modifications of modesty. The donkey, the fisherman's beast of burden, survived to carry lighter loads. Through yet another revolution, a social revolution this time, 
which changed Lubbock's day into two weeks holiday with pay. This year, 20 million people will spend both at the sea. For many, the coast was a sort of refuge, even if you did nothing with it but be there. It was a glimpse of another life, another style of existence, with a calm and tranquil pace. Even if you couldn't live there all the time, you were that much better off for being there a while. And the more technical and intricate did the life machine become inland, the more important became the value of mucking about in boats. This is what every Englishman believes he intuitively understands. Quite a few actually do. The watering place had vanished, and so had the myth that you went to the sea to drink it for your health, instead of fooling about on it for fun. The seaside became a release, an escape, another sort of world, where all values were different, where even the air was new. The warm sun peeled the problems away a rare and precious commodity, not to be squandered. On the contrary, to be tempted and encouraged, as it were a kind of treatment, a healing treatment. Dr. Russell was so near the truth. Still, nothing changes, really. Even now, this is everyone's recurring memory of childhood holiday. The beach, the sands. No one forgets, ever. We say, when I was young, they took me to the seaside, and there the world was always new and wonderful. There I met the sea, and I was happy. No one forgets. It lingers on. There is no age beside the sea when a man can resist the impelling urge to get his feet in it. One day is done, another supersedes it on the wheels of the new society. Now began the encroachment, not of the sea upon the land, but of the land upon the sea. Now came the liberation of the city people by the internal combustion engine. And good as it was, valuable as it was, democratic as it was, it intruded a new inescapable element, the crowd along the coast. were now a passport to pleasure, a manner of escape. And the centrifugal forces of society strewed the shore with all the congestion of city life we'd driven all those miles to forget. 
Some did more. They stayed. They put down roots. Shallow roots, more often than not, but tenacious. The shore took on the likeness of a shantytown. Unlike a shantytown, the huts gave much pleasure. And homes on wheels that were supposed to be mobile, whose only justification was that they could move into solitude, enjoy it and move on, became immobilized, institutionalized, petrified into communities. With firmer roots, the houses. Everyone who had ever spent a holiday by the sea wanted one day to go back and live there. One house, one caravan, one shack mean nothing. Added together, they mean hundreds of miles of coast cut off. This is not beautiful, but it is indeed an escape into happiness for so many people. How much more so could it have been? The sea is functional. The great ports were built for use and not for ornament. This is as it should be. Where should we be without them? Nobody asks for rustic grottos in Southampton or roses round the door. The fishing fleets of the industrial age cannot operate from sandy coves and old world bays. The fishing ports are workshops and must resemble workshops. It is arguable that oil refineries must haunt the coast since the tankers that feed them must by definition come from the sea. No one asks that the huge dockyards look like pleasure grounds. And this is just as well, since the 20th century cannot be uninvented. What could reasonably have been asked, however, is that things that did not have to be at the edge of England should not be there. The laying down of a barrier of railway between land and shore. the intrusion of unnecessary industry into the coastal scene because it was convenient. Because in those days, land by the sea was both cheap and plentiful and no one took thought of tomorrow. And because our ancestors could not foresee how their creations would grow, they bequeathed us a legacy that is hard to lose. Forty-nine fiftieths of England is owned by the English. The rest is owned by the Ministry of Defence, which holds 217 miles of coast as an essential part of training. As a reminder of the days when the coast was threatened from without rather than from within, miles of wire and concrete dragon's teeth, 20 years after the war for which they were built. The same 20 years have seen an empty sea acquire its own kind of congestion. There are half a million dinghies alone, to say nothing of yachts and motorboats. In the next five years, the numbers could easily double. When the beaches can be used by people, so can they be polluted by oil. The sludge dumped by ships far out to sea, virtually indestructible, washed up eventually to soil and sully wherever it arrives. There is a reason why the masses of the atomic and conventional power stations have to crowd themselves upon the shore. They need vast volumes of water for their cooling processes. And it is easier, certainly cheaper, to put the powerhouses beside the sea than to bring the sea to the powerhouses. Those are the problems. There are only 3,000 miles of coast, and there are so many of us. Housing, harbors, railways, roads, power stations, steelworks, refineries, coal mines. The mileage grows. The coast shrinks.
Not all is negative, however. We have become aware that our coast is very special. Already much has been done. Much is being fought for. This path is unexpectedly part of the fight, in which the National Parks Commission is planning long-distance paths, continuous rights of way on which a man can walk at his leisure around the shoreline. In the West Country, there is an almost completed stretch running for hundreds of miles through Somerset, round Devon and Cornwall, and back again as far as Dorset. The caravan can be a most romantic vehicle. It is not the caravan that is wrong, but the sighting. There are 400 caravans here, and where they have rested is little the worse for them. Concrete roads, small groups of caravans scattered to avoid congestion, and placed according to the lie of the land, trees and shade, and a decent view. It can be done. Likewise, even an oil installation can be planned to fit its situation. This was an old fort, adapted into a pumping station and offices, losing as little as possible of the character of its setting. The tanks themselves are camouflaged, landscaped into the scenery so that they don't blatantly proclaim their identity. The problem of oil sludge disposal at sea has been solved by three of the major oil companies. Instead of the waste being dumped, the tanker accumulates it within itself until it can be disposed of harmlessly into tanks ashore. Other companies are following suit, and tarry beaches should one day be of the past. holiday camp can be one sort of thing, or it can be this sort of thing. Little Orchard Village at St Agnes in Cornwall. What had been the debris and rubbish of a derelict tin mine was transformed by three local men who, having respect and affection for their surroundings, built this chalet village. Coast means the edge of the mainland, but it also means the islands around, like the Farn Islands of Northumberland, one of the most famous of wildlife sanctuaries. It is National Trust land, which means that it is permanently protected, with freedom of access for all. The Farns show how part of the coast can be saved and managed so that it can be of use and pleasure to the greatest number of people. It can also be of great help and value to the few, for the Farne Islands are a very effective tourist asset for the small Northumbrian fishing port of sea houses. Thousands of visitors are ferried to the islands every year, and there is room for both nesting birds and visiting people. The farns are of permanent value to the naturalists of the universities, an untouched laboratory for the study of seashore life in almost totally natural surroundings. The islands are, in the most painless form, educational, an open-air classroom for mainland schools, classroom where it is possible to see such rare sights as eider ducklings being led by their mothers to the shore. And although they are only a few hours old, they will take to the sea for the long swim to the mainland. Because the farns have been looked after and cared for, they can be shared by all. To turn the whole coast into an untouchable area, a sort of reserve, would be to defeat its usefulness. It is not there just to be admired. If the coast is diverse and various, 
so are the ways in which it can be enjoyed. It would be poor pleasure to have it all the same. For some, the seaside means the freedom to pitch their tent at will. For others, it means peace and quiet and not too many people. While the holiday camps are the new supermarkets of the seaside, the projection of community life in conditions both controlled and compact. And the tremendous milling multitude of the Blackpools is part of England's mythology. Those who don't like them don't have to go. Those who love them would go nowhere else. Lonely beaches, holiday camps or resorts, each must be available as the other. But there is not too much of the coast left, nor too much time to save it. The pressure grows. By the end of this century, there may be four times as many cars and 70 million of us. And England will not have stretched an inch. What happens then? What happens to this, so far still innocent? And this? In the future, it may not be such fun to be beside the sea, unless we cherish our vanishing coast.